first. Okay, I'm going to go first. Uh, I have uh, have an assistant that is coming in here with some more notes, so uh, um, I won't uh, stint on that. Um, um, I remember when this store was opened, by the way, in uh, the early 70s. We, uh, it's, uh, I haven't been back here very much, but uh, uh, Park Slope is, uh, uh, we came out here in uh, 1968 and bought a house 50 yards away on the other side of Palhemus, 19. And um, it was expensive. This uh, old Irish lady uh, was holding out for $40,000. <laughs> and, uh, and we got her down five grand, something we could afford. Um, and then I, I left uh, 20 years later in 88, having um, uh, raised a family here. And um, uh, so it's really good to be back. Um, writing a, a book about uh, uh, drug dealers is, is very alluring. And there are a lot of people do it because, uh, because you're dealing with, uh, um, with um, people, unless you're dealing with methamphetamine dealers or <laughs> heroin dealers uh, whose product is a lot more lethal right? Uh, they're basically an entertaining lot. Um, um, they, uh, while they know they're, they're criminals, they don't really think what they're doing is wrong. Um, selling stuff to people who want it um, at a market price, um, it's only harmful if you overindulge. Uh, but Sean Licker next door, which we used to, uh, we used to call Sean Licker, and he would not only deliver liquor, but he would deliver cash, money, and you'd give him a check. So he'd <laughs> cash the check, <laughs> give you liquor, <laughs> and uh, I just left him his the son a uh, note to say hi, Kevin. I think his name is. Yeah. To remember me. You, still deliver cash to houses along with uh, liquor. Uh, but these guys feel very clever about themselves. Um, uh, not only because they made a lot of money, but because they really enjoy the cat and mouse game with the police, which is automatically usually very funny. Um, uh, and they go on until they're caught. Um, but it's a lifestyle that to them is as addictive as if they you know, were putting something into their, their arm. Um, and very few of them get out of it safely. Very few of them you know, graduate to normality. Um, take uh, 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 my guy, George, who was in the protagonist of uh, of uh, Blow, he was free and clear of the law when he and I got together in 91, 92 for two years. Um, he had been, uh, he, he'd been let out for testifying against Carlos Later. Uh, he'd been um, not, he wasn't out on any condition. He, he was sentenced to 60 years. They just let him out. So he was given this incredible get out of jail free card. Um, so, so we talked, um, but um, the book came out I think in 93 and George uh, got bored. I mean we uh, went through all the TV shows and everything and there was nothing George could do that would engage him anywhere near as much. Well he couldn't do anything. I mean he wasn't, he was never employed other than in, in manual labor when he was a teenager. Uh, so so uh, he, he found, we, we had found this uh, Yaqui Indian down in uh, Puerto Vallarta who he had smuggled pot with in the 60s. He went back to Ramon in 1964 and they started smuggling pot again. Well, he got arrested right away for 600 pounds in his basement on the Cape. It was behind a false wall. He didn't know how. 
got there. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and he was, um, the prosecutor waved the book in the court uh, room, blow, said this man has flouted the law his whole life and the judge in 1980, uh, 1994 gave him 22 years straight up. He was 52 years old and he did every penny of it. He's getting out in May. He missed the movie. He missed everything. <laughs> he had to have Johnny Depp came to the prison to learn that that horrendous, you know, Boston working class accent that is the prob probably the actor's bane of any accents. Uh, they they went up there to give the warden and his wife a special showing of blow and everything. But George missed it, missed the whole thing. So he'll be out, I think it's May 28th, out of um, Fort Dix Federal Correctional Institution. And um, I've lost touch with him in the last several years, but he's, he has a website. He has a lot of people waiting for him out there. He's signed on with uh, uh, one of the uh, 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 piranhas in Hollywood, you know, who will guarantee you Oh, we're going to do a lot with you, George. You're going to be famous. And he is for a while. Something's going to happen to him. But um, so anyway, so, so, um, so George is 72. And uh, he's had a cancer operation on his, uh, um, on his forehead, uh, a melanoma. But I think he's OK. Um, so um, he's out in 72. Um, so our author tonight, though, uh, uh, he also knows somebody who's, who uh, stuck in with it a long time, uh, his old man. Um, um, so this is his first book, and it's a, I'm just reading uh, the, the bio, and it's certainly uh, an impressive career. Uh, uh, you've heard some of it, but uh, some of it that I uh, thought was interesting was he graduated from GWU, 2003, summa uh, uh, cum laude. Well, that's nothing. He graduated first in class. I've never known anybody. <laughs> I've never known anybody who graduated first in the class. He's very embarrassed about that, I'm sure. But it, uh, uh, then he went to Columbia for American Studies. Um, uh, and he found his way to uh, Newsweek magazine when it was connected with um, uh, the Daily Beast. Um, Even before that, when it was connected to uh, the American mainstream, before it became <laughs> <laughs> right. I my memory is hazy in that. Uh, and what interested me about him is he is he is a traditional jack of all trades reporter. I mean, they they're not around much anymore. I mean, I was looking at them. He's written about everything from from a um, uh, from a ten thousand a day corporate psychic uh, to the last surviving vet. Of World War One, the only black father in Baltimore <laughs> who adopted a white girl. We didn't fact check that. that is, that's an assumption. I think. Oh so. really? <laughs> oh. Well, so you know, past the days of Newsweek having fact checkers. Well, News, Newsweek, I would say, we, we no dropped other, their fact checkers. No other checkers. black father has come forward with a white daughter. Yeah. So I think yeah. we, I think we have it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I caught Newsweek when they started when I wrote for the Columbia Journalism Review, and uh, and they started dropping their fact checker. Uh, Checkers and I interviewed, I forgot, um, Smith, the, uh, the editor. Rick Smith. And, and he said, uh, well, yeah, I know, but, you know, just a few th mistakes here and there. He said, on the cover, they misspelled Gary Wills' name <laughs> on the cover <laughs> of the magazine. Um, uh, where was I? Oh, Black Father, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> portrait of, a, of uh, a reclusive author of the, of the anarchist cookbook back in the God knows when. Uh, uh, and one of the more effective exposés of the Scientologist L. Ron Hubbard, among many others. Uh, he's a senior writer at NBC News, lives with his wife and two children. Can I say just around the corner? Yeah, just around and, the corner. Uh, anyway, Tony, good to go. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, a lot of people in the room have uh, been aware of this book for a long time. Uh, it's behind schedule, um, fortunately behind schedule, right? It was supposed to turn it in two years ago, uh, and legal weed was not here 
Uh, and I 